Book of Ezra and Nehemiah play a very important role in the history of salvation. And the title of our series is God's Plan and Man's Participation. God's Plan and Man's Participation in that plan of God. And uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are talking about the second most important segment in Jewish history and in the history of salvation. For example, when Moses went to Egypt to deliver the people of Israel from the bondage of Egyptian Pharaoh, that symbolizes our bondage to sinfulness and how Jesus came to deliver us from the bondage of sin and Satan and death itself. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah are talking about the Jewish return from Babylon. After their 70 years of captivity, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, we are looking at the people of God when they are turning back to God. So, this segment of history symbolizes the condition of the people of God after they were in the promised land but because they rebelled against God and God abandoned them and then they were taken as slaves into captivity and in captivity God became merciful to them and God had a beautiful plan and a future for these people but to be able to enjoy that plan of God they have to return back. This is a symbolizing event in which whenever the people of God are returning to God, God does something amazing. And this is also the picture of a Christian life. Every time you see a Christian returning to God, you can guarantee for a better future. But people refuse to return to God. In Nepal, we have a church member, we call her Iche. What tribe is that? Anal? Anal. Yeah. She was a young lady, educated of her time. You know, she is now in her 80s. Last time I went, we met. You did not meet, I met. She was a young, educated nurse. Fell in love with a Nepali army man who was not a Christian. And somehow, she eloped with him and went back to Nepal. Her family is well-to-do in Manipur. But because she married a non-Christian man, also later it happened that he became an anti-Christian man. He gave her a very terrible time in her life. She suffered so much. She had many children. Then somewhere, somehow, she heard about us, that there is a lady also from Manipur married to a Nepali pastor, and eventually she began to attend our church. She tried her best to share the gospel to her husband and to her children and to her grandchildren, but most of them refused. Her husband was a very wicked man. She took care of this man in his deathbed as a paralyzed person and yet he would abuse her verbally and physically. He died, his sons died and gone. And they continue to suffer in one way or the other. But this lady, even now she suffers with some kind of a stroke on her one side. With the walking stick she comes to church. Her husband is dead and gone. Her sons are dead and gone. They become very criminal and in prison and incarcerated. And when they come out and drug addicts and all, and even grandchildren also in the similar condition. Daughter also died and gone. So sad for that family because this family refused to turn to God. Even though this sister who could have had a beautiful future in Manipur if she remained and found a better man, yet she took it upon herself to restore her life by returning to God. But by then it was too late. 
Even though her life is defined with suffering and misery, she is faithfully coming to church. In her old age, she has to walk two, three kilometers with the walking stick. She comes to church. And we can surely see a future in the kingdom of heaven where God will reward this woman in a beautiful way. She tried to share the gospel with her relatives and neighbors. She has done wonderful work. Very hospitable, kind and loving woman. And though family is in a terrible shape because the husband was a wicked man, sons were terrible, but this sister continues to walk with God. And we can be sure that she will have a beautiful end when she enters the kingdom of God because she has returned to God. That is a picture of any person who returns to God, like the picture of Naomi. She said, my life had been bitter, but when she returned back, maybe in her lifetime she only could see this the Ruth married to Boaz and maybe she died but till today we see the future of Naomi so from this series I'm going to share to us here in this local church and also to those who are listening on the online there is always an attempt by the people of God to call people to return to God return to God and my wife and I we have been in Nepal from 1992 and our ministry has been always call people back to God, not to look for the missionaries, not to look for the foreign support, not to look for the donations, not to look for this and that. And people have misunderstood us until today. But we have seen the hand of God. Today, Hope Church ministry in Nepal is doing wonderful thing without foreign support without any in fact the missionary have been one of the most consistent opposing factor for us all these if you look at the missionary if they remember pastor Bozra's, oh he's a he's anti-missionary we are not anti-missionary we are anti trust in human being and we have been calling the church in nepal to return to god and some have listened and some have not listened and the people who have been going after the foreign support foreign mission they have also seen misery follow them wherever they go. So today I am starting the book of Ezra series with the hope of helping you to return to God. How do you know you are returning to God or not? If you have no desire to attend a Sunday service, you are not returning to God. If you have no desire to read the Bible, you are not returning to God. If you can make an excuse to not to attend the church for small things, you're not returning to God. And if you're not returning to God, I can guarantee your life will continue to struggle. You will continue to face life in such a difficult way, like, you know, this heat wave is creating how miserable condition here, we can't sleep. So life that is one time walking in the presence of God has now gone back into the Babylonian captivity or the wilderness wandering until they return to God they are not going to find rest you may try money you may try to do this you may try to do that you may look for this and that you may go to foreign country you may work out something amazing but at the end of the day when you are not returning to God your life is going to be stuck no matter how much you try but on the other hand if you have a desire oh god tomorrow is sunday i want to go and worship you and somehow something comes along and you cannot attend the church service on sunday you have to do something your company told you to work extra or something terrible happened or you have to travel when you miss sunday if you have this missing sense oh god i wanted to go to church but somehow i have missed it and you start worshipping God wherever you are. If you are on a train, you start to worship God. If you are on a plane, you worship God. If you are working in your company, oh, this is time I'm supposed to be in the church, Lord. But today I could not come. So I will worship you in my heart, right in the desk where I'm working. That's a person who is returning to God. And if a person ret returns to God, their lives will be different. Your destiny is determined by the kind of longing you have.
to return to God. So the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is a section of a history in the Bible which describes a person's life when they return to God. So in today's plan, let us read uh, chapter 1 verse 1 to 11. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 to 11. And then I'm going to take you through some historical uh, data also. Let me read first four verses. In the first year of King Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. This is King Cyrus of Persia. Now, you have to see the big picture to understand what Ezra and Nehemiah is trying to tell us from their books. Israel was in the promised land and Israel was divided into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom was captive uh, or captured by Assyria and they were dispersed throughout Assyrian Empire. But the southern kingdom, the Judah, kingdom of Judah was still under God's favor, but they continued to refuse to listen to the prophet like Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, listen to me, people of God, listen to me. King of Babylon is coming to take you into captivity, but instead of opposing king of Babylon, listen to him, submit to him, and you will survive. But the people said, no, no, Jeremiah, we have the temple of God. We have the support of Egypt. We will not be defeated by king of Babylon. We will defeat king of Babylon. They began to make an alliance with Egypt. And Jeremiah says, don't depend on Egypt, depend on God. If you depend on God, God will defeat the Babylonians. But you're not listening to me. You are going to Egypt in asking help to defeat the Babylonian. But you're going to be destroyed. You will be taken into captivity. So in 606 BC, there was a terrible war between Babylon and Egypt. And Egypt was completely destroyed by Babylon. And on the way, in returning time, King of Babylon also captured Judah and had taken very wonderful people like Daniel as slaves to Babylon. But even then, Jeremiah was still prophesying in Judah. And he said, listen to me, listen to me. Don't depend on Egypt or don't depend on anybody else. Listen to the king of Babylon. They did not listen. And finally, in 586 BC, king of Babylon had had enough with the Jewish rebellion. And he destroyed the temple, burned down the temple, destroyed Jerusalem and took all the Jews captive. And even then he was trying to appoint some other people as his representative in Judah and the remaining Jews killed him. Finally, they took Jeremiah also and they ran away to Egypt. And the king of Babylon completely eradicated the Jews. Finally, they are in now Babylon. And in Babylon, maybe in 600 BC, Daniel was taken. Maybe in 586 BC, Ezekiel was also taken. So Daniel is in Babylon, Ezekiel is in Babylon, and they are ministering to the people through their ministry during this period of slavery or captivity in Babylon. Then you should remember, we, today we come to king of Persia. Cyrus, king of Persia. What happened during the ministry of Daniel? Daniel was in the kingdom of, uh, 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 during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian king. Then the Babylon was captured by Media. He was with the Darius I under the Medo-Persian kingdom. 
and even now when Persia captured Babylon Daniel was still in Babylon ministry so most likely it appears Daniel had taken uh, certain prophecies from the book of Jeremiah and book of Isaiah in Jeremiah it says like this this is what the Lord said Jeremiah 29 verse 10 and 11 let me read when 70 years are completed for Babylon I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future Jeremiah 29 verse 10 and 11 many people quote this verse where God says I have a plan to prosper you give you a future that was a plan God had for the nation of Israel and he said this plan will be completed after you spend 70 years so when Daniel was praying for the people of God he, he came to this passage in the scroll of Jeremiah and he began to fast and pray and God began to move in the hearts of Daniel and then he must have also listened what Isaiah had said about King Cyrus when King Cyrus came to power in Babylon Cyrus captured Babylonia and at that time Daniel must have realized this is the man whom God had spoken about nearly 200 years before Isaiah 45 verse 1 to 5 is a beautiful passage or the whole chapter in fact talks about King Cyrus but let me read verse 4 Isaiah 55 verse 4 says for the sake of Jacob my servant of Israel my chosen I summon you by name Cyrus and bestow on you a title of honor through you uh, though you do not acknowledge me and then he goes on even though Cyrus you don't know me I have appointed you I have anointed you I have chosen you so that you will let my people Jacob return this was the promise given to the people of Judah by Isaiah the prophet that one day God is going to raise Babylonian or a, or, a, or a Persian King Cyrus to help the Jews return back to their land so in Daniel chapter 1 verse 21 says Daniel remained in Babylon until the first year of King Cyrus in his position maybe at this time Daniel was becoming very old so the point is you go back to Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 to 11 in chapter 1 verse 1 says in the first year of King Cyrus Persia in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus how did he move most likely Daniel went to the king and say oh king listen what my prophet Isaiah had said about you 200 years ago you are a great king you're a mighty king in fact from the history uh, extra biblical history talks about Cyrus he was a very peace loving king he was a very unique king in that time all other kings were very ruthless when they captured other kingdom they will destroy the rebellion or opposition and then they will impose their religious uh, uh, bondage on the people that they captured but Cyrus he captured Babylonia without killing anyone peaceful capture and when the people came under Cyrus he gave them the freedom to worship the God they liked and in this process Daniel must have gone to the king and said oh king there is a group of people in your kingdom here who was ruthlessly oppressed by Nebuchadnezzar their temple was destroyed their city was destroyed their nation was destroyed and they are languishing in your kingdom and I'm sure when Cyrus read Isaiah's prophecy he must have realized maybe there is one true God that I have been looking for so in the history we do not know what God Cyrus was worshipping all other kings were dedicated to different gods and all Cyrus was the king who said you worship whatever God you will I will worship this one true God whether he came to know God just like Nebuchadnezzar through the ministry of Daniel we cannot say for sure but one thing is here here say 
this is what he said the god of heaven has given me all the kingdoms god my main point today is god moved the heart of king cyrus yet it was cyrus who had to make a choice whether to act upon that moving of god or not whether to allow the jews to return back and rebuild their temple and nation or not god may move your heart one time or another whether your obedience to that moving or not will determine the quality of your life many times people are moved emotionally but they do not become consistent they easily give up one day they did oh today i'm going to start praying today i'm going to start reading the bible today i'm going to be hungry for the things of god but then they later give up so easily king cyrus acted upon not only did he say with his mouth he made it a written declaration so that it will remain for all eternity or throughout the human history that there was a king who decreed such a decree king's heart was moved and then king decided to obey the move of god and what did he do he did two things one he said go and then secondly he said if you cannot go give go or give and people obeyed it many people began to bring gold and silver to support the work of god in jerusalem so god moves the heart of king cyrus god then began to move the heart of the people as well let us read verse 5 onward from verse 5 let me read then the family heads of judah and benjamin and the priests and the levites everyone whose heart god had moved that's my point again first he moves the heart of the king now he is moving the heart of the people of jude uh, jews who are living in babylonia prepare to go up and build the house of the lord in jerusalem all their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold and down if you read you see how many gold and silver and then next chapter we will see how many people decided to go back to jerusalem the main point one more time for jews at this time living in babylon was wonderful because king cyrus was a godly king wonderful king he was a peace loving king he said i will rule with peace not with power so the babylonia at that time is like the london or a new york at this time all these people who are living in uk or usa or australia or canada for them to be able to say i want to go back to iraq or i want to go back to sudan or somalia or bhutan or nepal or even many people to come back to india itself would be a challenge but here is a group of people who were living in babylonia a beautiful metropolis of that time and jerusalem was a desert land burned down through king's decree god began to move their hearts okay let us go back to jerusalem even though life in babylonia is very comfortable let us go back to build temple in jerusalem let us go back to worship god back in jerusalem so people's heart were moved to go and those people who did not go their hearts were moved to give and they gave with their material affluence so that ezra uh, at this time ezra is writing somewhere about 450 40 bc but the event that he is describing here is 540 in 540 to 520 we see the jewish people moving back to jerusalem to start the rebuilding process in jerusalem and the leader was sesbazar or jerubabel it's a one person with two names most likely even though some people believe there are two different people uh, one was an uncle another was a nephew or there are different other views how to say but most likely this is the same man with a babylonian name or a akkadian name or a hebrew name given in different context so under the leadership of jerubabel 
42,000 Jews decided to return to Judea. And when they came back, it was so discouraging. In fact, Jerubabel himself lost his courage. Jerubabel saw the deserted land and saw the people who were there so hostile to them, they became so discouraged. They stopped building temple. Instead of living in Jerusalem, these people began to settle in the, the outskirts or some of the villages where there is safety. They were so utterly discouraged because compared to Babylon, Jerusalem was a desert, a burned down city, hopeless city. Nevertheless, they obeyed the voice of God that moved their heart to go, even though they did not know how to go forward. So it was at this time, we will see later, God sent Haggai and Zechariah, two prophets who came to Jerusalem and began to encourage these people, say, okay, Jerubabil, it is so difficult. They says, this mountain is too high, too big to be removed, but not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, this mountain shall be removed. What you have started, Jerubabil, you will complete it, but not by your power, not by your uh, strength, but by the spirit of God. This was a message given to these discouraged people who had left a beautiful life in Babylon, come to the deserted Jerusalem, and there were people who were trying to destroy them, and they were totally discouraged. And eventually, at the end of this series, we will come to know that if you return to God, God will return to you. If you take a step towards Jerusalem, God will take a thousand steps towards you and he will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish whatever you wanted in your life. So today I will simply take you through this historical happening. Keep in mind, from every Sunday we will be looking at how God did this amazing work in the life of the Jews when they decided to abandon Babylon, come to Jerusalem. Which means Babylon symbolizes the world. Babylon symbolizes the life of pleasure and sinfulness. Jerusalem, though deserted, symbolizes the presence of God. In, in fact, when they were taken captive about 70 years ago, these same Jews who were in Babylon said, how can we sing songs of Zion in Babylon? By the river of Babylon, we sat and we wept and we lamented because we missed Zion. God has a beautiful plan for us, but he fulfills that plan through man. Your life, God has a beautiful plan, but he will not work unless you start cooperating with him. So that's why the plan of God and the participation of man is so important. Any person who participates in the plan of God, who obeys the movement of Holy Spirit in the heart, they will always, at the end of the day, will be victorious. So man is God's method. He always works through us. Today, God is building his church. Now, we don't have to go to Jerusalem today. We don't have to go to Israel to build a temple. God is building a temple. You are the temple of God. Church is the temple of God. Are you building it or are you tearing it down? Are you returning to God to build a temple for him? Or are you destroying this temple or neglecting this temple? If you have a desire to come to worship God on Sunday, you're building a temple. If you have a desire to feed your spirit through the word of God, you're building a temple. If you have a desire to live a holy and righteous life, you're building a temple. If you have a desire to spend time in prayer and seek God's will, you're building a temple. And once the Holy Spirit begins to come, your life will be different. Are we sensitive to the prompting of God's spirit? Are we willing to go out from our comfort zone? And how you build this temple? personally, your life first, and then the church. Your participation in the church, your active involvement in the church is like Jews returning to Jerusalem to build a temple for God. And when we have this positive response to God, miracles are possible. Every time we return to God and say, Lord, I am your temple, build my life for God. 
I don't know how to build it. It is so difficult. It is so deserted. Everything is ruined in my life. My hope is broken. My dreams are destroyed. My future looks uncertain. But Lord, I am your temple. Build me. Help me to build this. And God says, I will build you, not by your power, not by your ability or strength, but by my spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, he will build a beautiful temple. Let us pray.